All right. Hello there and welcome to our webinar. Uh, we are uh, the Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. Hey, Dr. Tolley, <laughs> thank you for joining us again. Um, so, okay, so it's the day before Halloween. We were just talking a little bit ago. Um, and before we let, let's let people log on, but uh, just wanted to, <laughs> was gonna ask you about your scariest um, client or experience as a veterinarian. I think you have a story maybe for us. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's, it's not uh, something that uh, uh, is is necessarily scary uh, in 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 a sense. Uh, to me, uh, it, more so, I guess it was um, uh, frustrating. Um, but uh, in in to not only to me, but also the the bird owner, um, and 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 it's something that uh, can happen. Uh, because I've heard about it from other veterinarians, and it's rare that it occurs, but um, and it's not something uh, that's common, like the bird talking to my mother uh, when she pulled the feather out, which would be somewhat frightening. Uh, and you say, well, all African greys can talk, but my mother, I, I think, did I share this, Laura, with uh, the group about uh, the African gray and my mother's African gray? No. I uh, well, she went to, she was out and she came back in. And, and if, I, if I've told this, uh, let me know. Um, uh, but <clears throat> she saw one of the wing feathers were, was kind of out of the, 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 you know, place. So she said, well, I guess it's just molting this, this wing feather. And I'm just going to kind of pull it on out. And then when she went up to the bird to pull it out, the bird said, "Stop! That hurts." Oh my goodness! And my mother just said, "Hmm. Well, that's kind of strange because possibly it does hurt, but where in the world did the bird pick up that that response? You know." I mean, because you don't go and to the bird and go, learn, stop, that hurts, stop, that hurts, you know, it, it's just something that was so appropriate for what was going on that it, it took her, you know, like, whoa, you know, that's yeah. weird. And so she said, well, where did the bird pick up that, <clears throat> you know, phrase? And she would wear earrings. And when she wore earrings, you know, the bird would be kind of, she'd be laying down and the bird would be and kind of play. And then the bird would feel her earlobe and it would be like, oh, that's kind of soft. That's, and then the next thing you know, the bird would start getting a bite her, you know, a little harder. And she'd say, stop, that hurts. <laughs> so the only thing that she could say is that, that that's where the bird may have picked up the phrase. But to use it at that time when she was pulling on that feather, um, I'm just going to leave it up to everybody to think about. <laughs> but uh, the other, the other was the African gray, <clears throat> um, where <clears throat> this bird was hand raised and it was, uh, you know, interactive with the owner. Very young bird. But African grays, and that's why you don't want to trim the feathers too much on African grays. You want to give them a little bit of lift. And anytime you trim feathers, it doesn't prevent birds from flying. It just restricts birds from flying. That's something that everybody always has to know. Um, now, uh, the only way you can prevent a bird from flying is uh, with one of the little birdie vests with a leash uh, on the vest or uh, amputation. That's the only two ways to actually prevent, know that the bird is preventing from flying. But um, <clears throat> restricting the bird's flight, if you clip the wing feathers, if the wind is high enough or the bird has enough uh, fight or flight, you know, uh, that it, it will, uh, it, you know, so all it has to do is get out of your reach into the tree and climb up the tree. Yeah. So you're only looking that the bird has to fly 10 feet high or whatever to, uh, to get out of your reach. So you always have to be prepared for that. 
but uh, this little African gray um, fell and cut open its chest area, which is not uncommon for African grays, which is why, again, you want to make sure they have the lift. But <clears throat> when it um, when it, it went through and we weren't here, we were out at, um, <clears throat> at, at a zoo looking at another uh, animal, and but it went to another veterinarian and they did the same thing that I would have done. I would, and we had been treating the bird uh, for different things over, it was young bird and he had brought it in a few times and no, no issues, but it had this little incident was anesthetized and it was sutured up. They put some, some stitches in the, the chest, just, just like I have done many times. And then <clears throat> gave them some antibiotics for the, the owner to give. And when the owner, the first time the, uh, the owner gave those antibiotics, the bird just went, just went crazy. And from that time on, that owner was never able to, to uh, interact with that bird. From that time on, he did everything, but the bird was, was, was just um, frantic whenever the owner would go near the bird. And all he did was try to, to, to administer that. And I've heard that happening a couple of times. Um, it's it's with with African greys from other veterinarians where they will have this this anxiety this 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 really this frantic uh, interaction with the owner where everything prior to one incident like that um, was fine and this was a hand raised bird and most of them are um, that this occurs on so. Anyway, I, I, you know, it's extremely rare, but um, it has uh, occurred and I can tell you, I, I have no clue what triggered that bird to have that response and to continue to have that response after that. With all the birds I've treated, that's the only one that that occurred. Um, and uh, Wow, sounds like a post-traumatic stress disorder kind of. Yeah, I, you know, but it, it la and I see a comment where somebody had mentioned that that occurred to one of their birds, and um, uh, and it was an African gray, um, and and I wish that I could tell you exactly what triggers that, but like I said, it's rare, but it 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 does occur, and no matter what you do, you can't you can't get them back. Uh, at, at this point. Yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness. Um, well, that's, that's, uh, that is a scary, uh, scenario there. Um, uh, let's see if you're just joining us, uh, this is Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. And, um, just a reminder, uh, that was just a little backstory because tomorrow's Halloween. So we're talking about some scariness and that's certainly scary. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, make sure that you use the Q and A button and not the chat feature. And um, we're gonna, I guess we'll go ahead and tackle, we got a, we got a, an African gray question for you. So, so far we got, we got some, some African gray content going for you African gray. Uh -huh. Good, okay. good, good, good. So Karen wanted to know um, her Congo African gray is nine years old and has shivered quite often for no apparent reason since she was brought home um, at 10 months old. From all I have read and heard on the webinars, he is eating healthy, uh, healthy diet and what are some of the causes of this? So what would cause a bird to be kind of shivering? Well, one of the things that um, <clears throat> is that uh, what you're what you're looking at is you've you've said this this uh, this kind of shivering. Uh, one, if it's a concern naturally to to uh, get it examined and, and determine if, uh, uh, and, and, and as I've always said, you, you look at the um, outside and the inside of the bird. And the only way you can look at the inside of the bird uh, physiologically, um, uh, of course you could do other things like x-rays, but is blood, is, is doing um, blood uh, testing, diagnostic blood testing. And if you, and if everything that, that comes back um, 
as a uh, normal or negative, and there's no other uh, clinical signs in the birds eating and maintaining weight, then this would be uh, somewhat what I would consider um, uh, the just a normal um, variation of this 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 bird's uh, behavior. So uh, I wouldn't say, uh, especially after nine years uh, and the birds maintaining weight and and doing well otherwise that. Uh, there are just various idiosyncrasies um, individual birds have, um, and it doesn't have to be uh, related to a disease condition, but it could just be uh, that ge bird's uh, general behavior characteristics. So if okay. everything's negative or normal, I would say um, that would be what, uh, what you're looking at. All right, and then uh, Tabia had a question about uh, Jende Conyer. Um, my Jende Conyer often self regurgitates after eating. He'll bob his head and looks like he's eating the food again for five minutes or so. Is this okay or is he harming himself? Well, <clears throat> the, the, uh, again, the, the question is, is uh, that, that usually isn't a, a kind of normal behavior uh, on a, on a long, long term, if it's not associated with a trigger, um, say like some birds will do this if they're uh, interacting with um, other birds or their owner, uh, which they may be more amorous uh, to or not. But um, as far as the gen, you know, uh, if this is a, a single bird and 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 doing this, um, this is something that. Um, uh, may be uh, due to a, uh, uh, a possible uh, uh, you know, irritation or uh, something that is causing a um, uh, possible some type of a constriction of the normal um, food uh, going down. So it should be um, uh, you know examined to, to determine if there's any infl an inflammatory condition within the the uh, the crop or um, a, because uh, that could cause uh, some 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 irritation as the food goes down into that area, which would 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 cause them to to regurgitate. Um, and, and the bird may be adapting You say, well, the bird's uh, normal weight um, and, and it looks otherwise uh, healthy. That's again where uh, <clears throat> the, the blood work and an examination and, and, and what we call cytology, looking at the, um, the organisms that would be in the, uh, the crop that may be um, a hint on what may be going on. Okay, um, let's see what else we got uh, for questions. Okay, uh, so Mary wanted to know, um, she says that our, our vet said birds can't have any acid like pineapple, um, but I also heard sprinkling apple cider vinegar to prevent bacteria is okay for all birds. So what is your take on that? Birds can't have what? Um, like an acidic kind of um, acid, like like she's saying like pineapple, which I eat, I guess, acidic. Um, but she's also <laughs> heard of the um, recommendation of sprinkling apple cider vinegar um, to prevent bacteria, like bacteria. Well, I haven't heard, heard that in particular um, as far as they can't have that. Um, I think <clears throat> that um, there's nothing that um, would would uh, be problematic with with giving those. That's my my personal opinion. Um, everybody has one, right? And uh, and as far as uh, as far as my recommendation nutritionally, um, uh, again, like uh, I think we mentioned before, that uh, avocado, chocolate, um, or or two that I wouldn't give. Uh, I know that I've heard people have. Uh, um, said tomatoes uh, before, not, not that knowledgeable on many birds that say, give me a tomato, you know, that that's one of their uh, desires. But 
I can tell you, we, you know, in, in, in acidic, uh, we, we could talk oranges, okay, um, on that. Uh, I know that well, we've given uh, oranges to birds. I mean, uh, and not just because we've done it many years ago, because what we've done many years ago may not be acceptable now that with more knowledge that we have, but I haven't heard uh, when, when uh, we would, you know, we've given that to birds, we haven't had any issues with it. So I don't, I don't see uh, any, any issues with uh, that being a, a kind of part of their diet. And then uh, also uh, what, what we're looking at is a, um, the, the, the apple cider vinegar. Yep. Um, I haven't heard anything problematic uh, with it. Uh, although I'm not sure what the, um, you know, if we look at research and we say, uh, and that's, that's just uh, like a lot of the nutritional supplements uh, that are out there. And we've talked about them before. Um, the scientific research on the benefits of those. Um, it's very difficult to try to determine how beneficial or if they are beneficial. We just don't know. Um, I don't think that um, giving it in, in, in small amounts would be problematic, but I, I just don't think in, in, in general, um, most birds would, would benefit from that um, in, in based on my experience and what birds have done, you know, what we've seen uh, that have had a good balanced nutritional diet um, um, in general. Okay. Um, oh, and just a uh, reminder that if you have a question, use the Q&A button, please. Um, that way we can capture it better. Um, so here we have a question um, from Denise. Uh, my 10-year-old golden conure has a wheezing sound. Uh, we have no avian vets in this part of Canada. I started him on Tetratex yesterday. hope I said that right. Will that help? He has barbed all of his feathers when I bought him five months ago. Um, also, his, beaks keep, his beak is growing fast and she just got a trim last month. Um, is it, and it's very long already, um, is this common? So we've got a few things going on. A wheezing sound, um, barbed feathers and a beak that's growing fast and she's starting him on tetradix. On what? What? Uh, it, it's spelled, it's tetradix, T-E-T-R-A-T-E-X. Yeah. Is the name of the medication. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not familiar <clears throat> with that, that medication in, in, in general. Um, it, that's, that's, uh, unfortunate that you don't have, I always tell the students that we need more avian veterinarians or more veterinarians that have, uh, uh, an interest and knowledge in, in basic avian medicine. <clears throat> so I'm trying to get them out there, trying to get them out there. And Canada is a beautiful place. Um, but uh, this is where uh, with the wheezing sound, that's something that uh, I'm not sure because I'm not familiar with the medication uh, or what you're providing, if it is a medication, um, you know, uh, with the wheezing sound, it could be an infectious process that's going on. <clears throat> um, and and um, from lower in the respiratory uh, system, uh, this is where uh, looking at uh, the, the blood uh, the diagnostic tests can determine if you have an inflammation uh, that may be associated with it. Uh, so, and, and then also uh, x-rays uh, may be uh, indicated to see if there's anything that could be noted in the lungs or in the air sacs that, um, and, and then you can go into endoscopy. So, so um, a, a wheezing sound uh, is, is indicative, of course, of a respiratory condition and that uh, further diagnostic testing would be uh, helpful in trying to identify specifically what that that would be. Um, not sure about this medication. Like I said, <clears throat> it may be beneficial. It it, it may not. Um, but but 
uh, that's what the uh, always is the big question or questions when you are just treating a disease problem that you don't know what it is. You know, you limp and you say, well, <clears throat> I, I, I'm going to treat with um, uh, Advil yeah. and maybe it'll go away. You know, well, if it isn't something that's responsive to Advil and you don't know what it is, then, then of course the Advil isn't going to, to help, right? So, so that's, that's the, and so what you, you know, unfortunately I, I can't uh, on that. And then um, <clears throat> really the, 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 the barbing of the feathers, is that what it was? Yeah, he has barbed. He has barbed all of his feathers um, when she <clears throat> bought him five months ago. Yeah, and, and then and, also about the beak growing really fast. Yeah, you know, and she got and a, a trim. Of, one of the situations you have here, you have possibly a behavior issue, and of course, if you have a behavior issue where you have um, um, feather destructive behavior, which is the the term term du jour right now feather destructive behavior, not feather picking. Uh, so this is, this is very good uh, just uh, description of it. It's feather destructive behavior. It's destroying the feather architecture, the architecture of the feathers. And in what, what you look at is <clears throat> on this is that you have a condition where you have a bird that has a, a feather issue and what do you do about it? Well, one of the things that um, <clears throat> you always uh, try to do is, is if this bird was an older bird when you uh, received it, uh, would be to try to discuss uh, kind of the conditions that the bird was in uh, before you, you purchased it, before you obtained the bird. And if you can see how the bird and see what the bird uh, was um, conditions that it was in at that time, then that was when you purchased it and this behavior was not occurring. Now, naturally you're taking it out of an environment and putting it into a new environment with a lot of different variables, you know, new people, things like that. And so um, it, it's, it's good to see what the bird was happy with, uh, obviously uh, in, in good feather condition and then try to see if there's something that is going on with the bird um, as far as its environment and its general um, <clears throat> enclosure to see if you could try to mimic uh, how it was before when the bird was, was possibly happier. If you bring it into an environment um, where it's much more active or there's dogs or there's cats or there's more, you know, children in there or whatever. This all may have a, a factor in, in the bird's general um, acceptance or uh, acclimation to that, that, that new, new place. And, and if it's not comfortable, then it may express its uncomfort in the feather destructive behavior. So that's just some, some thoughts there. Now, as far as the beak is concerned, um, the, this is a, always a thing that, that uh, people say, oh, I need the beak trimmed, it's too long. Well, one, one, the first thing that I always try to do, well, you know, if I see the bird, I'm looking at the bird and, and, and thinking about, uh, and, and people are asking about, uh, you know, trimming the length of the beak because it's too long. Well, I'll, I'll first, you know, look at the beak and, and, and in my mind kind of have a, 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 a picture of what normal is. And so you say, well, I don't know what a Golden Conyers normal beak length is. Well, go online, look at, at, at a uh, Golden Conyers and see what the normal beak length is. Now, we may be talking about a golden conure like we have had birds. We've had a, a blue and gold macaw where the beak curved around and stuck into the side of its, of its face. Okay, we've had, so that's a long beak. That's a scary beak. Uh, that's right? a long beak, I'm gonna yeah. say. 
right? yeah. that's a long beat. You don't have to graduate from veterinary school to figure out that's a long beat. But the birds are <clears throat> brachygnathic, which is a term that means the jaw is in and their beak goes out, uh, the upper beak goes out in front. That's normal. And the beak should extend to, you know, below or, you know, close uh, when it when it's closed, the the lower, lower, uh, lower beak. Um, but of course, if it's too long, then um, then it should be trimmed. You have to be careful because we've had a number of cases. I mean, it's just one of those things where, you know, in the last three or four months, we've had about four or five birds that could have come in where the beaks have been broke off. We even had an eclectus where the beak was broke off. And uh, my colleague, we had to give it a blood transfusion because if that blood transfusion wasn't provided, the bird probably would have died, okay? So that's how bad beaks can bleed if they break. No different than if you're trimming a beak, you don't want to trim it too short. So, um, and it's very difficult to stop bleeding in a beak when it, when it bleeds because there's bone in the beak. That's what the primary tissue is in a beak. It's not hard, you know, uh, care to, uh, a surface like the outside, that's very thin. The primary uh, tissue is the bone in the beak. And that's, and that's, and it's spongy. And why is it spongy? Think if it was, if it was solid bone, how in the world could a toucan fly? It would be going like this, right? So it's spongy light bone. And that spongy bone is like you, when it breaks and you have a sponge, it's hard to get, stop the bleeding because the, you have all of these holes and all of this, you know, where like the, the bone um, is, uh, is lightweight. And so you don't want to trim too much because it can start to bleed. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's when you know you've gone far enough. And that's not uncommon if you are trimming a long beak because where that, it's hard to determine where that, 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 that vascularity or the blood flow uh, stops uh, at that. So you don't want to trim uh, too much uh, on that. Yeah. So maybe leave that to your, your vet or your experienced groomer. Basically. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, and just a real quick, um, so let's say your bird injured the beak and it broke the tip off and it was bleeding. What could you immediately do before you can get them into the vet? Like, can you, apply pressure with, you know, with a towel or like, is there anything that you can do with it? Um, I knew you were going to ask me that question, Laura. I don't know. I mean, Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. Well, the problem is, is, uh, is, is stopping the beak and having something handy uh, to um, uh, um, actually uh, cause the hemostasis. Um, and stop the bleeding. Um, and, and also you have a bird whose tongue and, you know, it's excited, something just happened, there's blood and it's tasting the blood and, and, um, and, and you know, back to Halloween, right? And, 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 it's, and it's, it's scary for everybody um, on this uh, because it's, it, 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 there's a lot of blood flow uh, from that. Um, and so what, what can you do? Well, it is an emergency situation and it can bleed very quickly. And, and so, <clears throat> you know, if you have, they have uh, some uh, hemostatic powders and you wanna be careful when you, when you place this, um, because uh, like I said, the, the broken area and if the tip's broken, or um, if, if another bird, and we have had this where they'll bite off the beak, um, that if that happens, um, you, you wanna make sure that if you have any kind of hemostatic powder or something like that, that um, that, that will 
uh, you don't want it getting in the bird's mouth where it swallows it. And that's a whole nother problem, okay? Um, some, sometimes, uh, you, know, you know, putting uh, pressure on it and, and keeping pressure on it um, is, is helpful. Um, and I always say some kind of a powder or something like that to try to, to, to plug up those, those areas um, is, is helpful. And, and like even flour or something, if you have some, something like that, that's kind of non-toxic, but at least it'll help and with pressure and to put some type of a, a, a tape or something like that over that broken beak is going to be, you know, uh, kind of help reduce because you're not, it's going to be hard to keep a towel on that beak with a digital pressure uh, until you can get to the uh, veterinarian's office. Okay. And, and, and when, when the owners get here, of course, we have all of those powders. I always look for hemostatic powder. Uh, also, electric artery we use, uh, and that that that's that's very helpful um, when you have a hot, uh, you know, electric artery works well on that. And silver nitrate. These are all things that um, uh, that we use to try to stop the bleeding uh, on that. So some type of like flour or something like that, and and some type of a uh, uh, some kind of a uh, a bandage over the beak that has pressure, that maintains pressure, that'll stop that blood flow or try to reduce that blood flow is the best bet on the way going to, to the, uh, the veterinarian. Um, and it, because unless you have some of the hemostatic powders um, and, and also um, are comfortable in applying those without the bird actually, you know, ingesting any of that. Um, but the other thing that I want to mention as far as breaking that beak tip, going back to the fact that the bird's beak is, is primarily bone, is that when that breaks off, um, and, and, and if it's the, the beak is, 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 is uh, bit off by another bird, or flies into something and breaks the beak off at the, at the face, facial area, the facial bone, or halfway, um, uh, and, and the bone is involved, the beak isn't gonna regrow back to normal length. It will heal at that spot. So it's not going, unless the very, very tip of the beak is broke off, don't expect that beak to look normal afterwards. Oh, okay. so, you might have to adjust the diet a little bit to get that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we had a question from uh, Tamea asks, can birds get jet lag? If so, what, what can you do? Uh, a jet lagged bird. Jet lagged birds. Um, I, um, I, I think that if they're, uh, you know, why not? Why not? And uh, the, the reason is, is because, um, you know, just the same reason that anybody else gets jet lag, you know, you uh, leave during the day, and you arrive there the next morning without sleeping, you know, and so uh, there, there's going to be uh, kind of a physical um, acclimation uh, to the time change. So um, they'll probably be um, irritated didn't, and have uh, uh, not their, their normal uh, interactive behavior, just like humans um, with the time change. So uh, the only thing that uh, you can do is just, uh, I don't think uh, giving them melatonin is going to be uh, helpful, um, but I would say, um, that uh, it, you know, just like humans, they'll adjust in a few days. Which reminds me, so um, there you go. this weekend, our, our clocks go back. So we will be having a time change. Well, in some areas, some states, um, 
Well, that's right. good because everybody will get an extra hour of sleep on Sunday. Yes. Hopefully Another the birds reason to look forward to fall. Hopefully the birds get that memo so they're not waking everybody up. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the lights are, it's going to get lighter um, earlier. This yes, day. it will. So, um, okay, so we have a question from Monica. She asked, do birds lose bone mass by not being allowed to fly at all? And can they ever regain the bone mass once it's lost? That's a good question. Um, I would say that um, that's a good question. Um, and all of these are great questions. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, do birds uh, lose bone mass, um, that, um, and, and also uh, you can go into muscle mass on that without exercising. And uh, as far as um, we, we look, and I'm just thinking on this question, um, as we look at radiographs and x-rays, diagnostic images, we look at the, the cortical bone, okay? And that's the bone that you can see, the skeleton that you can see. Halloween again, I'm just mentioning skeleton. Oh, with that theme, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, trick or treat. So anyway, as we as we look at that, we look at the density of the, the, the cortices. And so looking at the density over, over time, um, and I'm just thinking historically and thinking about what our uh, diagnostic imaging specialist, our radiologists uh, look at, uh, the cortical density in, in, in even cage birds and in, in, in birds that have been uh, uh, in, in uh, you know, handled and not flying for, for many years, it doesn't appear to be, um, I guess, problematic or less than others. Um, and, and, uh, but, um, you know, and then and this, this goes into where you look at variables such as calcium, uh, do they have calcium supplementation? Vitamin D3, we've talked about that a little bit on some of these. Are they getting the sunlight so that they can get the, the D3, uh, the, the vitamin D that they need to absorb the calcium from their, their intestinal tract? Um, is sunlight's good. And so they're inside, they're not getting sun. And, and um, so I would say that uh, in general, the, the, uh, the strength of the bone um, is probably better uh, and the integrity of the bone is probably better in a, a bird that's getting plenty of sunlight, that uh, is getting um, uh, exercise um, and, and, and moving around. <clears throat> but is it a significant uh, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, significantly uh, different than, than um, say, uh, one that isn't or that didn't get, it's not getting the exercise, it's not getting the sunlight, um, it's not getting the, you know, I mean, uh, the, uh, they, they have to be getting the calcium supplementation and nutrition that normally is provided. But if they're provided an, a, a good diet, um, then I would say that it's not significantly uh, different or a problem, but uh, you know, just based on physiology, that there is probably some difference in that. But I don't think it's going to be uh, just based on my experience. Uh, uh, as far as the health of the bird, it's going to be that that much of a problem. But good, good, good question. Okay, and then Tina wanted to know, is there a way to um, age a sulfur crested cockatoo? Um, hers is a rescue who clearly has had a few homes before her. Is there no way to determine if he's 20 or 50? Mm, no. Now, the, the, you know, sulfur crested cockatoo, and we get into ages and, and, and I'll go back because we have a, a number of participants that may not have heard some of the things that we've talked about before. But I would say your, your medium parrots, such as your in, in cockatoo species, such as your sulfur crested, something like that, 
Um, I would say uh, the average age of those are 30 to 40 years. Now you're gonna have some that live longer. We've talked about that. Um, just like humans, the average age of somebody in the US, um, may, uh, females a little more than males is about 80, okay? Uh, actuarial tables, you get 80, everything else is gravy, okay? Eat the cake, you made it, woo! And so my grandmother lived to 98. You have people that live to 100 and over, but that's not average, okay? Average is 80. That's the finish line. Everything else is victory laps. And so what you're looking at here is uh, 30 to 40 on these medium uh, macaws uh, based on some of the information at Parrot Jungle, um, about uh, 45 to 50, okay? Uh, and so looking at that, <clears throat> um, the, 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 the situation is how do you determine age? Age is similar. There's no way to say specifically how old this bird is. Um, and once it reaches maturity, the younger birds, you have uh, darker eyes and they lighten up as they age. But um, the older birds, what you look at is kind of telling the age is uh, uh, for those with feather coloration, uh, you may have started not having as bright of feathers uh, in geriatric birds and also uh, lens opacities, uh, similar to, to humans getting cataracts. Birds also get lens opacity. So if, they, if the bird has lens opacity, that would make it uh, an older bird. Um, specifically how old, um, it's, it's hard to say. And then birds with, you know, skin that you can see, which is not uh, primarily around the eyes and the face, um, not so much in a sulfur crested cockatoo, um, but that that also starts to sag, just like like uh, everybody else. The gravitational pull and the elasticity isn't the same when you're older, and it's good to get there, but it's just not the same. And so those are, those are characteristics that you can look for uh, in an older bird, but as far as trying to determine the age, um, that would be um, not possible. Okay, so you can't just visually look at it and give a good estimate, that makes sense. No, no, can't uh -huh. look at the mouth and look at the teeth. Yeah, because usually with dogs, you can look at the, right, they use, teeth and all that other stuff to kind of gauge an age, but birds, we don't have teeth to do that with, so no, there you go. No, no. Um, all right, and then Shona wanted to, um, let's see, to ask. So she has a 20-year-old um, uh, YNA, YNA, okay. Yellow naped Amazon. Thank you, yellow naped Amazon. Um, my 20-year-old yellow naped Amazon has been getting a light wing uh, trim his entire life and he has never flown. I'm letting his wings grow out, not because I want him to fly, but people on some groups just shame you for not letting them be fully feathered. Do you think this will change his behavior? I doubt he'll be able to fly since he doesn't have the muscle or am I better to keep him with his wings uh, clipped or trimmed? Well, that's totally, you know, that's, that's uh, a, a um, I wouldn't call it Phil philosophical question, although it could be, I guess. Uh, do you trim the wings? Do you not trim the wings? And everybody has their own opinion, okay? Um, I think that it, it's dependent upon what you feel is, is best for the bird, okay? And what you want to do with the bird. Um, and, and, and so why some people don't trim them, it's, it's their... Um, it's their decision and why some do, that's their decision. Um, uh, just the same way, uh, you, you know, just with anything else. Um, I, I uh, you know, and, and, and everybody has their rationale. This is why I do it this way and somebody else, this is why I do it this way. And whatever you feel is, is best, um, I, I, I can't say that, uh, um, over the years, I've, I've, I've seen people who 
have not trimmed feathers say, oh, this is fantastic. This is what happens and everything like that. And those that uh, um, have not uh, trimmed feathers you know, or who have trimmed the, the, the feathers uh, say, oh my goodness gracious. Uh, oh, I've seen this problem and that problem. And I, you know, I, I haven't seen anything with one one the one the birds that have people have trimmed feathers or those that haven't trimmed feathers I, I i haven't seen any issues one way or the other you know and so um and 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 i could say that probably um that you know it's kind of hardwired on the birds how to fly and if they start and they're built to fly so if they can fly they will fly but they don't know what in the hell they're doing <laughs> excuse the expression but they don't you know it's just like woo you know i'm hey look at me i don't know what i'm doing and then boom they, <laughs> they fly into the wall or the next thing you know they fly and they're in a tree and they know how to climb right so then they're 50 foot in the tree and they they don't know what and they go like that's high I don't know what, what do I do now? I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> and so that's what happens. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always uh, interesting. And, uh, but uh, I, I think it's dependent on what you can do, you know, you feel is best for your bird and what you want to do. And I, I support uh, bird owners on whatever they want to do. Uh, when we, we trim the feathers, we try to do it um, uh, the way that we recommend and um, based on the, uh, the bird that we're trimming the feathers for. We always ask the owners because anytime you're doing grooming, it's, it's, a, um, it's the owners, uh, you know, how do you want the birds? You know, we'll tell them what we're going to do, but what do you want you know, uh, from the grooming? What do you want from a, a feather trim? And, and then we try to say, you know, if they say, ah, the bird, I don't want the bird to fly. I said, that's not going to happen with a feather trim. The bird will fly, you know, if we do it correctly. Um, it's just going to be restricted in its flight capabilities. Um, never, never assume that the bird can't fly if it gets the feathers um you know if you live on a you know 10 floor floor apartment you know and the bird is can is outside it's going to fly you know it may not go far but it'll fly off that 10 story roof or the ledge there balcony so never assume that getting the feathers trimmed the bird can't fly um but but uh with that, you know, we always try to say, this is what to expect and make sure that that's the case. And so you need to know that. And if the bird has feathers, I would say it's going to fly. It may not fly because of you said, because it hadn't flown, has not flown. It may not have the muscle, whatever. Um, it's no different than if you've been, you've never run before and you have to run, you may not run far, but you'll go faster than you walk, right? Um, so that's pretty much the situation there. So if you want to let the feathers grow out, that's great, you know, and uh, just just be careful because if the bird gets, it, it may not know what it's doing, but it's like, I need to fly because I'm scared something's after me and boom, you know, it's, it's, it's off, you know? Um, and it doesn't know what it's doing. And so that's, that's probably what I would consider the most problematic situation if the, the bird is um, not experienced uh, with, with flight, is that it just doesn't know what it's doing. Okay, good point. Um, and then uh, Lisa wanted to ask you, what are the most beneficial nuts to feed parents? The nuts do you recommend? The most beneficial nuts. Um, well, 
I would say that that's a good question. It's like, what's the most nutritional, the best nutrient, uh, what candy has the best nutrition? Okay. Again, a Halloween reference. We're just yeah, I, I mean, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Reese's peanut butter cups. Okay. <laughs> but the, and, and the reason I say that is because, you know, and, and I, you know, feed nuts to my, my, uh, my birds. Okay. Um, but uh, in, in, in a small amount, and that's usually their favorite food item. That's the first thing they'll go to. Okay. And, 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 and the reason I say what's the best, because they all have um, nutritional issues. And one of the problems is, is that they are, many of the nuts that are out there um, are lacking totally in certain vitamins. And so, uh, and, 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 and we see this with, with uh, hyacinth macaws, um, with macadamia nuts. People feed them macadamia nuts because they can't feed them their normal palm nut that they eat, but the macadamia nuts are high in oil and people have, have mentioned that, <clears throat> that um, you know, well, you know, feed them macadamia nuts, you can't get the palm nut, that it will be more conducive to reproductive activity in, in hyacinth macaws. But macadamia nuts have, they don't have vitamin B12 in them, none. Brazil nuts do not have vitamin B12 in them. And you start looking at different nuts, they just don't have certain um, nutritional items, which is why if you can and you know, have a base with a, um, in a diverse diet that the birds eat, um, uh, you know, a pelleted um, base diet, um, which has vitamins and minerals uh, impregnated into the pellets, um, that that's, and, 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 um, and, and uh, a seed, a diverse seed diet uh, in, in within that, in, in their dietary offering, that you're going to be, um, that's going to provide that, that nutrition that uh, the birds need um, on a daily basis. Um, is, you know, since most of the species, we don't know what their daily nutritional requirements are, that's your best bet to come close with that diversified diet, in my opinion. But as far as the best nut, uh, you know, the one that it likes the best, you know, um, that, you know, but, but a, a small amount, you know. Okay. That's a good answer. Um, and Pauline wanted to know my 10 year old, um, Maximilian Pionis feathers have turned dull and dusty recently. What can I add to her diet to bring the beautiful colors back? <laughs> they have those iridescent feathers that are really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> what can you, what can you do? I guess the, the question is, 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 is what's causing that. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I always try to, to recommend um, on, on uh, the feather, um, before I get to recommendation, so we're looking at, at feather, um, I guess, I guess feather issues here, um, where they're dull and what? How did that? Dusty, happen? dull and dusty. Okay, dull and, and dusty. Um, so first of all, you have to look at, is it um, how the feathers were or did they kind of develop into this? Um, meaning, um, were, you know, as far as the feathers, uh, you know, were they like normal at one time? And sounds then, like it. <clears throat> huh? It sounds like it. Cause she said that, um, they, they turned 
that w recently. She mm. wants to get it back to being beautiful. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the issue is that, you know, what I, I look at here is, <clears throat> is it something, uh, because most of the feathers, when they, um, their architecture and structure uh, and color um, is all um, in place as they grow, okay? So, so if you have, say, um, let's say you have a red canary, okay? Red canaries, uh, they have to feed them a color food uh, when they are molting. So the color that they intake is incorporated into the feather when it is, it grows out. So it's not like if the bird is not molting and new feathers are not growing in, it's not like you could say, oh, I'm gonna feed it a color food this week and in three weeks it's gonna be red because it won't be. The only way if there's no feather growth occurring that you can make a red canary red is paint it with you know, spray paint. And you don't want to do that, you know? And so, 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 you know, the question with the Pionis was all of a sudden, you know, did, <clears throat> were they fine uh, when they were, they grew out and all of the feathers were, were good. And then all of a sudden, oh, it wasn't molting, but now it's all their dull and, and, and uh, feathers and they don't look uh, in a normal appearance. One thing is always to try to, to encourage if, you know, in, in, in Pionis, kind of a South American bird, do a, a spraying, you know, with, with water, you know, uh, baths uh, in some, some form to see if that's not going to aid in, in you know, the bird being able to preen or what have you as far as the, uh, the feather uh, uh, structure goes. Um, and, and, and then also, <clears throat> and, and this is with the coloration being already there in the feathers. So this is something maybe get, uh, have some sunlight um, and, and, and get the bird and, and, and do this. This may uh, improve as far as the, the feather coloration. Then also something, you know, what goes in, you know, you know, good nutrition in, good nutrition out, right? So you look at your nutritional, uh, is it the same diet that you've always been feeding? Is it the same as the bird eating well? <clears throat> and and is this is this what it's been for the number of years that they've had the bird or you've had the bird? Um, and because diet can also be be affecting if they're missing something that that could also be be that that case. Um, I would try the the uh, the shower, the bath, the water spraying, the sunlight to see if that doesn't help. Uh, initially, uh, if the bird is not showing any other problems, if it, you know, if that doesn't work, then, then, then it would be a, a good idea to, to, to get an exam to see if there may be something, this is something indicative of, of a, a condition that's going on inside, you know. And just to, so nutrition with, um, let's say with feather quality, that, could that be just say for years that the bird was maybe deficient in an area and then it finally kind of shows up later? You know, it's been something that's been in the works for a bit. And sometimes it could take, <clears throat> they could take a, a, a little bit of time. Um, I know that um, uh, to, to show up, depending on if it's, if it's um, just like anything else, um, whether it's a toxin, uh, that, and I'm not saying this is caused by a toxin, but a toxin that if you, in ingesting it over a long period of time, you may not see the effects until it builds up into the system later. And then it's so if you have a nutritional um, deficiency, it's not necessarily going to show up 
you know, within this malt or this malt. It may take time before it gets to the point where you see the physical um, reaction to yeah. that. Okay, so yeah, that's correct. It, it may take time. Now, there are vitamins. I know um, Lefebvre has uh, Vivi 13. There are vitamins that you can put in if you want to try to get uh, um, uh, other vitamins, uh, you know, to try to enhance the, the, uh, the ability of uh, the nutrition uh, to see if that doesn't have an effect. I know Necton, Necton vitamins, uh, are very good and they have, uh, uh, I think Nikton Bio, I think may be associated with uh, specific feather uh, coloration and, and structure. So uh, it's N-E-K-T-O-N and it's one specifically for feathers. So that's something else that um, could be considered to try. But I, I really, the, 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 the baths and the sunlight um, would be, I think, something to, to uh, start with. Okay. Um, it looks like we are just about, I think uh, we're com coming up on time here. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning of the webinar that we were going to give away a, um, a bag of tropical um, fruit pellets, which is the new Lefebvre diet. So, um, and also our winner today is also going to be able to choose their own bag of Lefebvre product that they want for their birds. So they get two ah. bags. Yes, right. So we had to, I get announced our winner now. This is the best. This is the fun part for me. Um, today's winner is it's Patricia H. So Patricia, um, you are going to be uh, contacted uh, by Monday, and we're going to send the, the bag of tropical uh, fruit pellets out to you and a, a bag of your choice. So something to look forward to. Um, start November off on good fun nutrition, right? Because <laughs> next week is, uh, or we're starting November pretty soon. <laughs> so, um, and also uh, just, a, just a preview of what's coming up next Friday, uh, we are doing a Bird Talk Magazine reunion webinar. So I'm excited about that, especially because I get to reconnect with Melissa Kaufman, who was um, my editor on Bird Talk when I, back in the day. So we're gonna have a Bird Talk reunion. And with that said, we're also going to, um, have a watch the birdie um, slideshow. So if you have a photo of your bird, send it to uh, customer service at lefebvre.com. Send it by Monday and we'll try to include it in the um, our watch the birdie um, slideshow of so you can see your, your pet bird show up here. Um, with that said, uh, Dr. Trolley, thank you for these wonderful answers um, to these really awesome questions. And if we didn't get to your question today, we'll hopefully send you an email with the reply and um, or we can save it for next time. So, so. Well, well, thank you, Laura. And I want to thank all the participants. Those questions were fantastic. And, um, and, and it was a, a pleasure as always. And you did great, uh, you know, leading the show there. And uh, I want to wish everybody a, a happy Halloween and may you receive all of the treats and no tricks. <laughs> How about that? Great. There you go. All right. Blend it on that. So everyone have a great weekend and all the best to you and your flock and stay safe until next time. Thank you. All Bye. right. Bye-bye.